Right, we did do all the introduction earlier. I'm Stephen Ellis. I'm one of the other solution architects here in New Zealand for Red Hat. We now have a team of three solution architects. Andrew, who's here earlier, is now a permanent solution architect based in Wellington. Um, myself and Mandy tend to specialize in certain technology fields. Part of my background is in infrastructure and operations. I helped build and run operations teams for many years, help people do Unix to Linux migrations, people deploy Linux at scale before I came to Red Hat. So whilst um, I live in kind of the pre-sales organization of Red Hat today, my background is, is predominantly operations and operational infrastructure. So I've used a large number of automation tools over the years in various roles. Um, so a quick question for the room. How many of you have used Ansible? Okay, how many of you have heard of Ansible? All right. How many have used Puppet, Chef, CF Engine? <laughs> you don't want to go there. That's where I started. The Bash is where I started. Off. Anyway, CF Engine. Um, salt, any Salt users? You've really had your hands there. Yeah. Yeah, you've been, you've been through the ringer. Um, things like PowerShell or just shell scripts. There's many ways of automating your environment. And sometimes it's as simple as having a run book. Much as Mandy did earlier, that's a simple run book. It is a way of describing an outcome you want to achieve. Ansible is one of the most perfect ways of describing an outcome. It's a perfect description of what you want to achieve. And unlike some of the other technologies out there, it isn't ultimately convergent on the outcome. When it finishes, if it completes correctly, it has achieved the outcome. You know that it's built the environment. You know that it's rolled that database back you know that it's made the change that you required. So for me, when I first came to Ansible, it's like, oh, do I have to learn something else? And that was, that was too easy. What was wrong? What am I doing wrong? Because one of the things I love about Ansible is how shallow its learning curve is, how quickly you can get benefits from it. As I mentioned earlier, for some of the demos that we do, it really is a lifesaver. I really have walked on stage and rebuilt an entire environment from scratch while I'm presenting about the demo I'm about to run. I've never been able to operate at that level before, reliably, repeatably. And so Ansible really is everything you can repeat, you can automate. Everything you should be repeating, you should automate. If there's any repetitive task, try and automate it. But also think about the tasks which are prone to error. They're a great way of tidying things up. And in fact, from Red Hat's perspective, Everything we're doing at the moment, we're looking at Ansible as a way to deliver a positive outcome. Think about it in terms of next generation operations. Instead of us telling you how to fix the problem of your server, why don't we just give you the Ansible playbook to run? Well, we'll do both. We'll tell you how to fix the problem, but we'll also give you the, the, the script to remediate it that will operate reliably regardless of where you're running that workload, whether it's in the public cloud, on-premise, or it's a containerized workload. Let Ansible deal with the heavy lifting. So what is Ansible? Uh, it's an open source community project. We're Red Hat. Everything we do is about open source in the community. We bought Ansible uh, about two and a half years ago now. And it was seen as one of the leaders in that field of not just configuration, but automation and orchestration. It moved beyond just managing configuration files into actually automating your IT ecosystem. So Ansible Engine's our supported product, but if you want to go and play with Ansible today, you can just go and download it and use it for free. It is the same build of the community is the build that we support currently in the enterprise. That's very, very different from everything else that we ship, where we, for the example, with Linux or OpenShift, we curate a version based on the community at the moment, there is no difference. When you get support from Red Hat, it is on the same version you can go and play with for free. The difference is what we support. So we provide all the usual things you expect from Red Hat, bug fixes, security fixes, and all that good stuff. But we also provide uh, support around the core modules, and I'll come to the importance of that shortly. And we start providing you with guidance and assistance around the technology. And then where Tower comes in is taking that next level up, providing that enterprise framework for large-scale businesses to consume Ansible at scale. 
something that was mentioned earlier in the open shift session is what you do about secrets what you do about like credential credential management how about you could delegate to the test team the fact that they go and need to roll back an environment as part of a test run rather than asking the database administrators to do it but it's as simple as pressing a button the behind the scenes they never need to know the credentials they never need to know the systems they don't need the usernames and passwords they didn't even know what the script the script itself is doing as long as it produces the outcome they require this is what tower kind of helps bring to you ability to delegate access to run all those automation tasks it is a very very vibrant community i just updated that this week based on the latest ansible 2.6 release we've now got over 1650 ansible modules so modules is where we do the heavy lifting for you instead of i need to install a piece of software but only install it if there's a newer version or only install it if it's not present you just say install the software ansible will take care of all the edge cases it will check to see if it's already installed or present maybe you want to go and push out a configuration file but you only want to push it out if it needs changing you only want to restart the service that configuration file relies upon if that's important that's where modules come in and modules mean that we can interact with endpoints in your infrastructure above and beyond a linux system or a windows system we can talk to network endpoints we can talk to um, cloud services we can talk to an awful large range of technologies and all the heavy lifting is taken away by the ansible modules which means that your definition of the environment your definition of the outcome is concise and that's really important because that makes it human readable perfect description and a document it's almost a living documentation of the environment you want to deliver it's cross-platform and now part of that is the fact that it's agentless when we talk to linux systems we do use ssh when we talk to windows systems you use winrm when we talk to a network switch we use their native protocols we talk to the cloud providers we use their apis unlike some of the other alternatives out there you don't have to go and install agents and configure things before you see value out of ansible this is getting to be really important in this new security landscape that we're seeing if you've got a major vulnerability and you want to go and do a vulnerability scan, there's several ways of doing it. But if you want to go and do a registry check across every window system in your fleet, that's what, three, four, maybe eight lines of Ansible. You could give it an inventory that is your entire Windows fleet and it will go off and check for a known vulnerability that may be resident due to a registry issue. Maybe I'll go and fix it. So our team. Our security team regularly publish Ansible examples and error remediates major security problems. Version control. Everything's plain text. Infrastructure as code. Data center as code. Everything you do, your description of your network as code, it all lives in version control. It does play incredibly well with others. So if you already have a sunk investment, if you're dealing with a customer or you're a Got an environment where we already have a large amount of automation, shell scripts, um, 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 uh, Windows uh, bash, uh, sorry, uh, Windows scripts, um, investments in technologies like Puppet or Chef. Then, in some cases, you may trigger them off Ansible, and Ansible will wait to see and won't come back until they've achieved the outcome that you require. You already got an investment in PowerShell, well then you can use that alongside your, your future investment in Ansible. You can refactor things over time, it isn't a big bang cut over. It does play incredibly well. And we're starting to see that with the big other vendors out there. Companies like VMware, HP, Cisco are starting to invest in Ansible capability around the edge of their existing management tools. Dynamic inventories. How many of the environments you deal with today are very static? They're constantly changing. As we were seeing with uh, Mandy's use cases, you may place triggers on containers so that they expand and contract based on workload. Same thing is true of cloud environments that you may set auto scale rules. If you want to go and apply a change across an environment running in Amazon, is it running on eight VMs, 10, 12, three? You don't know, you shouldn't care. Let's pull a dynamic inventory and let's have it tagged so that I can go and update the systems as required. 
So big strengths, simple things are simple to perform. The language itself is simple to understand. It's very human readable. It's easily accessible. It doesn't require complex coding skills. Your operators can get involved. But this also allows for delegation of um, outcomes based on the different skills in your organizations. So your DBAs can develop the scripts to roll back your database. Your network team can write the Ansible playbooks to configure and change their network stack. Maybe your test team or your developers start cooking up their own playbooks to produce useful outcomes. And I'll come more to that in a moment. But the idea there is it's usable across every team. It's very, very powerful and you can produce some very, very complex and interesting outcomes. As we said earlier, we've got a set of playbooks for deploying OpenShift itself at scale. So no matter where you're deploying OpenShift, whether it's on-premise, public cloud, um, something like OpenStack, Azure, AWS, we don't care. You can use the Ansible playbook to define a description of your OpenShift infrastructure and redeploy it as many times as you wish. You heard Mandy talk about the, the use case of Macquarie. I've got another customer who's capable of redeploying their entire production OpenShift stack in two hours, 30 minutes because it's the perfect description of the outcome they want to achieve. And this isn't half a dozen VMs. This is a fairly large scale environment. And then that agentless capability. Very efficient approach to delivering outcomes. So what do you want to do? Do I want to orchestrate an environment? Do I want to just manage a few configuration files? Am I going to be deploying an application or a multi, uh, a multi node, multi endpoint business service? Am I provisioning new workloads or provisioning new network switches? Because everything we've got across the top could apply across a whole range of endpoints from firewalls, load balancers, traditional infrastructure, storage devices, network devices, et cetera. So it is a true Swiss army knife for automation and orchestration. So here's a, a, a kind of a classic example of where operationally, one typo can cause a world of pain. How many organizations have got a desk procedure that says, okay, I want to do a rolling deploy and I've got to stop the monitoring on server A. I'm going to take it out of the, the load balancer. I'm going to go and patch it or update it, roll the new application code out. Then I'm going to roll it back into the load balancer, revert all my steps, and I'm going to go to the next node. And this poor person at 2 a.m. is sitting there going through all these systems, right? I'm lazy, I automate everything, right? The first thing I've ever done with an organization like that is find the best way to automate it. This is great. But let's take the extensible model of, let's delegate the right outcomes to the right part of the organization. Let's extend this. Instead of just deploying the application, the test team have actually got a smoke test. Why don't I borrow that code and put an extra step in? So before I revert the steps to go and put the business service back online, I'll smoke test it because I already have that smoke test well-defined, well-delivered by the test team, and I can just go and execute it. And then I can automate the whole process. I can time it. I'll just trigger it to happen at 2 a.m. What I'll do is I'll actually at the end build in an alarm, so if it goes wrong, it's gonna page me if it goes wrong. And 99 times out of 100, hopefully even higher, it doesn't go wrong and I don't get woken up. I get to sleep through the change. This is a big outcome. It's an important outcome because we've automated the outcomes. So how does Ansible itself work? So we have the user writing an Ansible playbook. I'll show you some examples in a moment. But it's written in YAML. Yes, spaces are important. For anyone who codes, I apologize, but spaces are significant. But it's not difficult to use, and we have useful tools to make sure it meets your syntax requirements. But things are executed sequentially. This is important because you know where you are in the point of execution. When you've reached the end, everything has been completed, or if it doesn't reach the end, you know at what point it failed. Unlike some other platforms, Puppet in particular, where it ultimately converges on the outcome you want, but you don't know how long it's gonna to take to get there. Modules are the, the heavy lifting, they're the tools in your tool set. So they let you do all the really smart things and make your code as concise as possible. 
Plugins are ways of extending the core engine. Um, the inventory is that list of systems grouped in various ways, tagged in various ways, so that I can go and apply a change across my, all my infrastructure just to the production dev servers, so production web servers, or just to my dev database servers, so that you can go and affect change in different ways based on a, an inventory. And these inventories can be dynamic. They can be pulled from a CMDB. They can use a Perl or Python or shell script and be queried off an existing infrastructure platform. As you said, what we're, to, what we're doing is we're going to pull metadata maybe from a CMDB or from a public or private cloud, and then we're going to go and this is broken, but then we're going to roll that out to your host, your network devices, and all the other endpoints. So we're starting to see Ansible to be considered the, the de facto language for DevOps, because in some organizations, it isn't the operators that got involved first, it was often the developers because they were seeing it as a way to make some of their deployments cloud agnostic. We we're seeing it as a way to do certain heavy lifting in a manner that they weren't tied to particular uh, proprietary vendor technologies. And now we're starting to see the same thing happening from the, the operators where those desk procedures, those standard deliverables, they're easy to automate through things like Ansible. So the key here is where regardless of whether you're in dev test, QA, or other way to production, regardless whether it's operations, regardless whether you're working with outsourcers or other groups in the organization, you can all get involved. And I've said this to a couple of our larger customers. It's critical that they build towers of capability rather than silos of automation. And the worst thing they can do is to say, oh, well, for this project, we're going to go and automate it. And they don't get any reuse from the project over here that's automating something almost exactly the same way. Start leveraging these towers of capability you've got, a set of operational capability, a set of development capability, a set of test capability, dev as uh, a database or network, and they can develop the, the standards that can be reused by multiple teams in your organizations. So here's one of the simplest playbook examples. And this really shows how it's almost self-documenting because the names kind of highlight the steps that we're performing to produce the outcome. We're going to install and configure a web server. Real simple example, we're going to install Apache, we're going to make sure it's running, and we're going to make sure it's got the right configuration, for the, the right um, content, the H, uh, index HTML. So hosts means that from the inventory we're passed, we're going to apply this on every host that's tagged as a web server, tagged with the term web. I'm going to become yes. Well, this is important because um, around how you manage security. Are you going to be SSH in as root? A lot of people don't like you doing that. So we might be SSHing as a de facto user, an Ansible user. Become yes means we're going to sudo, we're going to rescalate our privileges in order to perform um, software install. Variables means that we can override settings within a configuration or within an environment. So when I go and execute the playbook on the command line, I can override that variable and say, well, instead of running it on port 80, I want to run it on port 8080. This makes that playbook more reusable by using variables appropriately. Now this, I'm keeping this quite simple right now. This is a real simple example. As you evolve Ansible as a capability, you start developing something called roles. Roles are truly reusable artifacts in your organization, and the proper use of variables is really critical then, because those roles then become truly reusable. If you design them well, there isn't an excuse for the team next to you to not use them because they need to run that service on a different port, or they need to change a password or another configuration element. Mm -hmm. Variables are really, really critical. This is where we drop into the modules. The Yum module says on a Red Hat, Fedora, CentOS box, I'm going to use ROM, Yum to install their HTTPD server. I'm going to make sure it's the very latest version. Copy, I'm going to copy a configuration file to a destination. Each of these elements will only be executed if they need to be. If I run this and it executes correctly the first time, the second time I execute it, it will tell me that those elements are sane and correct and no changes needed to be made. 
I could run it a dozen times and it will only make changes the one time to that endpoint because it will validate that the destination file is still correct. It will validate that the service is already running, it will validate the software is already installed. You don't need to perform that validation. That's the power of the modules. So I've got a simple multi-system demo here. I'm going to initially trigger this off on the command line. The code is up on my GitHub. I don't know why it's called that. All the guys in Singapore wrote it originally, and I've simply um, iterated on his code and added a few comments because, yeah, it needed them. So I've got three VMs. I've actually got four because I've also got a tower instance. So these are actually running locally on my laptop. Uh, so I'm actually running Linux here, and I've got three virtual machines running. So I've got a CentOS 7 VM and two RHEL 7 VMs, and those are the names of the, the three VMs I'm interacting with. What we're going to do is we're going to install HA proxy onto the CentOS instance, and we're going to put Apache HTTPD onto the two RHEL instances. And we're going to expose a certain set of ports to make them available. And then I'm going to enable the HA proxy to operate round robin. We talked earlier about you know, uh, routing rules, which is simple round robin across the two web servers. So a real simple example. But the point here is I'm not injecting information. I'm not telling the CentOS node the names or the IP addresses of the web servers. Ansible's providing them as part of this. If I added a third node, it could be automatically added into the configuration of the HA proxy. If I remove a node and rerun the Ansible playbook, it would remove that node name from the HA proxy. All of this is happening dynamically within the Ansible playbook. So what we'll do, I'll jump over here. So what we've got here is a host file. And in this case, I'm doing something you shouldn't do when you're doing mature Ansible. I'm actually injecting variables into the host file. This is a nice way to get up and running, and it saves me typing them all out in the command line. So regardless of what uh, bit of the playbook I'm running, I'm going to pass in the value of the HTTP port that Apache is running on, because the HA proxy needs to know about it, and the web servers need to make sure they're listening on the correct port. Initially, the Ansible group is going to perform a few basic setup tasks like uh, install and configure NTPD and a few other core uh, system services. Then on the web servers, which are the two RHEL 7 nodes, I need to make sure that they know where to pull the code that they're going to run for this website. For the load balancer, I need to make sure it's listening on the correct port. I need to tell it to run in a round robin mode. So these are just variables I'm injecting into the playbook. Here's the playbook. Now, the playbook itself uses roles. So basically, for the host tag Ansible, I'm going to run the common set of tasks. For the host tag web servers, I'm going to go and uh, execute a base Apache configuration. And then for the host tag as load balancers, I'm going to configure them as, as a HA proxy. Now, under the hood, there's some more uh, roles being executed. All this code, as I said, is up on my GitHub box. It'll make more sense when I go Ansible. Yeah, more. So this is going to execute now. It's going to go out to all of the endpoints. Hopefully they're all online. And in fact, here, I've got a shell on all three endpoints. You can see when they were last updated, two of them on the 19th of June one on the 27th of June. So these are the little stub VMs I use for doing lots of demos. Um, so I can roll them back to a known state from doing anything with customers. So it's now going to go out and start rolling through a set of tasks to install and configure the environment. While that's running, we'll cut back and talk a little bit more about some of the features of, of Ansible. So Ansible, as we said, ships with around 1,615 modules today. And it covers a wide range of technology areas. From your typical cloud endpoints, uh, some of them might not be that familiar to you if you aren't from the US, but there's a lot of um, you know, public cloud providers outside the mainstream big three in the US up here. Virtualization and containerization technologies, and there's many more outside of this. 
Windows is really interesting. We now consider Windows to be feature parity with Linux for all the core kind of standard things you'd want to do. Install software, configure users, add things to a domain, configuration files, edit the registry, and so forth. So an awful lot of the heavy lifting for a Windows environment, all of those day two tasks now can be handed off to Ansible. And it integrates with Tower very nicely into Windows AD for getting the credentials to operate on a Windows platform. Network is very, very interesting for us. The network vendors have bought into this in a big way. Some of it has been, they've seen the momentum. Some of it's been customers telling them that they need to adopt Ansible as a standard for managing their network devices. And we're iterating on this very, very rapidly. So you'll notice in the Ansible ecosystem, there's a lot of changes specific to the network uh, footprint. And Notify is quite interesting. Chat ops, chat ops integration. So why not get notified in Slack or Rocket Chat or IRC, whatever it is you're using, when a task completes or a task fails or a job doesn't work? Or in some cases with some large customers, they've got two-way interaction, so they can actually kick jobs off out of their Slack channel and tell Tower to go off and perform something on their behalf. So they've got a two-way communication path via their, their chat system. So it means operators can go and pick up a ticket, go and perform a task based on a ticket, close the ticket, without ever leaving the chat session. If you ever want to hear talk about it, um, the team from Dropbox uh, did a talk at Linux Conf AU in Geelong about two years ago on the way they're delivering chat ops integration into their day-to-day -day management of Dropbox. It's really, really cool. So in order for a module to be accepted, it's got to be well documented. And that means that we, in the documentation, don't just provide guidance on the variables or the elements you use to execute a given module. There's also code examples of how to use it. And one of the beauties of Ansible is there's a big community out there of users. So odds on every module, if you do a search, someone's got a code example there in the world of how to do something really complicated with it or something really simple with it. And take the crawl, walk, run approach. You can deliver some amazing business value through some really, really simple playbooks and then iterate on it. Because guess what? It's infrastructure as code. It's living in version control. It's really easy to refactor. Some of my own playbooks started off as simple flat playbooks, and then I start to, to refactor them into roles where it makes sense as, a, as I start achieving bigger outcomes and delivering more services. Let's see how my code's doing. So at this point, we've at the top, we've gathered some information. It turns out that one of my nodes still we had LibSE Linux Python installed, the other two didn't. It's enabled the Appel repository, imported the GPG key, NTP was already installed on all my nodes. It's made sure the NTP conf is the same. It's uh, started the service, which you will only do if it's not already running, if it was already running on that node. Uh, we didn't need that task. Uh, SE Linux was already running because I've been in operations and SE Linux rocks, so it's always turned on on my test environments. Um, restart NTP, and now it's moved on to actually configuring the web service and installing HTTPD. So I can see what's being performed on each of the endpoints. Uh, go to github.com slash Ansible. And we've got examples regardless of whether it's Windows, Linux, examples of security, uh, network demos now. We've got a whole range of Ansible references out there, including some labs that you can run internally to get your team up to speed with Ansible. So where Tower comes in is about en enabling that next layer over the top. So for me as a user, I'm executing Ansible here on the command line. I'm using my keys, my SSH keys, my credentials. Problems if you want to go and delegate this out across a team, provide multiple members of development team access to go and roll back the development environments around production, you want much more 
uh, course of control, sorry, much more finer control than the course control you've got in dev. Also, when you get out to production, you may want to log who's doing what when. This is where Tower starts to add value at the top. So Tower is the, the enterprise framework. And like everything else we do, it's a UI and a RESTful API. Ultimately, everything you do through the UI is calling an API. And in fact, there's a CLI for Tower as well. Most customers don't tend to use it. Very fine-grained role-based access control that will integrate into LDAP, into AD. And you can then map those uh, roles inside AD onto appropriate roles and access rights inside Tower. Um, everything centrally logged. And not just log, but we log the time. We log every success and failure. And it integrates well into technologies like Splunk or Elk or other logging platforms. So you can perform analytics across the jobs that are running. Maybe you want to do a trace on why a job's now suddenly taking 25 minutes when you take four. And you can run it in various levels of, of debugging. So this is still running. We're now installing Apache. This is happening live. So yeah, with your internet connection. So Tower adds a layer over the top. You can just go and run the open source community version of Ansible. You can go and get support from Red Hat for the Ansible engine. Or you go and throw Tower over the top and you get that control, knowledge, introspection, delegation. And particularly for our customers in the network space, we're enabling a whole raft of extra features inside Tower that the network community is quite excited about. Some pretty cool stuff. And I'll show you a few um, screens of some of the initial uh, mock-ups we've done of the new network features. So when you layer it up, we've got all those use cases we mentioned earlier. We've got all the endpoints in the enterprise. We've got Ansible itself, that open source engine. And then Tower now is also open sourced. Because we're Red Hat, everything we do, we open source eventually. Uh, when we buy proprietary products, and Tower when we bought Ansible was a completely proprietary product, has now been fully open sourced. So if you want to go on your hands dirty, yes, go and have a look at it. But they'll come and talk to us. Tap us on the shoulder. We can see you with an eval. Don't play with the community if you can play with the enterprise. We can give you access to go and try this out in your organization. What's nice is that Ansible integrates with a lot of things. Under the hood, it's got an internal Postgres database. You treat it like an appliance. You don't worry about it. In fact, we've recently started enabling Ansible Tower to be deployed in a podified form on top of OpenShift. So you can now run it as a container as well as a, a VM approach. You can integrate with a whole bunch of artifact endpoints. Typically, GitHub will be your source of truth for all the playbooks you're executing. Um, you've got your um, clients accessing it. If you may put a load balance in the way, because you can actually scale Ansible Tower out. And in fact, we now have with Ansible the ability to have um, basically execution nodes that will run in remote network zones. So if you need to span Ansible out into a very distributed customer environment, you can actually put basically Ansible execution nodes into different endpoints inside the customer's infrastructure and have everything centrally reported back to a, a HA Ansible Tower footprint. And then on the side, it will talk to your common cloud platforms but, and, and to things like your domain controller for identity in a window space your CMDB, and also integrating to Splunk if you want to use that as a Oh, that's finished. Right, so this job is run. We've now got a HA proxy. We've now got two web servers. So in theory, I should be able to go and actually access them. Right. If I go here, there's one of my nodes, and I can see the software that I've got installed just now. Ditto, this one had very little, just needed HTTPD. It only installed the software that was needed. Everything else was already present. And then the CentOS node, it's installed and configured HA proxy. So if I jump up back to my web browser, so there's the code including the example of the host file I'm running. So if I try and hit refresh now, it's still not accessible. That, that one is, which is great. The other two are. And there's a reason.
I run demo nodes that are very secure. I need to go and open the web server firewall port. I also need to go and enable the port to access the HA proxy. Otherwise, this isn't going to work. Because my test nodes are ultra hard. All the firewall rules are turned on, SEM alerts is turned on. So to correct this, we've got a little playbook. We'll go and fix up the firewall. Again, using those variables. So I can go here and go and run that. And instead of that, I'm going to run firewall. This one should be pretty fast because it's just going to go and do a quick couple of firewall changes, not installing any software. So we'll just take a moment while that runs. So this is where you start wanting to chain together playbooks to produce an outcome. Think about this in an in a enterprise environment. That may actually be an F5 firewall change or some other network change. Well, that may be an artifact produced by the network team that I want to consume as part of an application deployment. As you can see, one of the nodes, nothing got changed. The other two are in the firewall rules. So let's go and try again. So I can now access those two. And this is round robining, except I don't have an IP address. You notice the IP address of this document is empty. Hmm. So, Turns out the code we're deploying uses server-side includes to go and inject the IP address into the index page. Now that's a security risk, you really shouldn't be doing it, but for the purpose of the demo, we're going to turn it on. Instead of going and pushing an entirely new config file for HTTPD, all I'm going to do is update the settings. So I'm going to enable the correct settings in the HTTPD conf to enable server-side includes on those endpoints. And then I'm going to restart Apache, but it will only do it if it needs to. All right, so I'm going to do, I'm going to run this. It'll go through the endpoints and make the change. So this could be something where, oh, there's a new security vulnerability with SSH or SSL. I'm going to disable some ciphers. I need to disable those ciphers over my entire fleet. Right, well, I'll come up with a playbook that will just go and edit the file and delete the cipher or force disable the ciphers I no longer want using. How long does it take you to go and edit that file and restart the services on a thousand systems? Days. With Ansible, it can be done in a few minutes. So these are kind of examples that we're regularly publishing at the moment up on the Ansible uh, blog. So if I go here now, I've got the IP address, IP address, and this one is round robining around. There should be an image below this, but Nick, who wrote the demo, has just gone and pulled that. I need to go and refresh this. I only noticed that today. So I can only change so much code before I came in here today. But that's round robining between the two nodes. So there's three playbooks chained together to produce an outcome. Why not automate that? So, Tower is a top level administrative interface across your Ansible infrastructure. Here I can see what, what's been recently run, and I can also see those recently run jobs. So, I can also see workflow. Uh, I'll, I'll, do, I'll, I'll run you through a few of the features. So, we can do this in a multi-organizational footprint. So if you're running Ansible centrally, say your business has multiple departments, you want to give them fine-grained control at a departmental level, you define different organizations. But often just teams are sufficient as a breakdown of the various groups in your, your organization. Credentials is where you store things like SSH keys or other credentials, but we do have support for also uh, backing some of this into third-party credential stores like uh, HashiCorp Vault. Inventory scripts is where if you want to go and define dynamic inventories for talking to VMware, Amazon, etc., to go and pull dynamic inventories back that, that Ansible can consume, you start defining them. You can actually create uh, custom credentials for other resources that Ansible traditionally doesn't understand. So this is your kind of base configuration of the environment. Projects is where we start pointing at your Git repositories. This is where we start consuming resources and being able to delegate them out. 
um, a given project is just a source code repository. Or it may be a directory structure on disk. We've had quite a few customers ask recently about integrating this with Windows ecosystems, where at the moment we don't have a direct plugin for their version control platform. So what they've got is a, a script that goes off regularly and syncs stuff off their version control platform onto local disk inside the tower. And then we point tower at that set of Ansible playbooks so they can be consumed. So the one I'm playing with right now is called Unicorn, and that's the Git repository it's come from. I've said the source code type can be Mercurial, Subversion, Manual. Uh, Insights is a proactive operational framework from Red Hat. As part of that, we publish Ansible playbooks for operators to consume. So you can actually plug this into Insights and also actually pull them out of Red Hat's infrastructure and go and consume them. We can pull from a specific branch tag, etc. We can even consume a source code credential. So if you've got a secure public repository that needs credentials, you can go and consume that. So I can go and consume this and say, well, every time I go and launch this, uh, anything out of this project, I'm going to do a refresh off Git. Therefore, I've always got the most recent version of those playbooks. Or I'm going to um, only update it when I request it here at the project level. So I can go up here and go to any given project and tell it to automatically refresh it. And you can see immediately the Git uh, revision here. So I've got a range of uh, repositories I'm pulling playbooks from. The great thing here is everything we're doing here, you can apply role-based access, but also you can apply security control so that the consumer of the playbook can't see the code. So they don't even know where the Git repositories it's coming from. They don't need to, because that may be in conflict with your security policy. That user knows how the database is being reverted or how the network stack is being configured. Inventories are manual or dynamic. For the case of this, I've got a, a manual inventory. As we said here on the command line, I've got a manual inventory file. My inventory file here has um, these hosts, and you can see the different groups they've been tagged to be members of. Now, again, these inventories can be imported out of a text file, out of version control. They can also be exported back out of tower. Uh, so there's lots of ways you can still treat your infrastructure as code. Templates is where you pull these two elements together. I want to go and plug a, a playbook, an inventory together, and then I want to define it so that these, these individuals or these groups in my organization can execute it. So a real simple one would be um, you know, enable Apache SSI. So that's what the last thing we ran was out of the Unicorn server inventory and Unicorn server project. I'm going to execute that enable SSI YAML. Right. Uh, here I've got another one which was Oh, here, HA proxy and firewall rules. So again, the same thing, but in this case, I'm choosing firewall.yaml. Now, because I've selected that project, I can see every playbook. So it introspects the uh, project tree and looks for all potential executable playbooks. So I can create many uh, templates in here. One useful thing, though, is a template can run in two modes. It can run as a run job or a check job. If you've got a paranoid in environment where change control is very strict and in production even if someone has manually changed something you need to put in a change request to change it back well maybe you'll set certain jobs to run against production every night in check mode they'll run in check mode and they'll run in a way that if someone has gone in and modified the infrastructure in production or the operation environment it will raise an alert the same playbook will be run in run mode to revert the problem, to apply it back to a known safe state. The same playbook is a check, a validate, as well as a revert the problem. So there's lots of other ways of using this. Certainly. Yeah, yeah let's right just come again. on. Yeah. But where, 
where it gets useful is um, the ability to define workflows. So what we did earlier is we executed HA proxy in Apache. Then we set up the firewall and then we enabled SSI. That was a chain of events. Now, as I said earlier, these could have been provided by different teams in the organization. I want to define a business outcome. I want a button I can press that delivers a business service. Right? I can chain them through the work workflow editor inside Tower. And in fact, if I go back to templates, now I've already run that. So I'm going to now run it again out of here. It's that one. And we'll leave that running. So it'll take a moment and slowly you'll watch it move through all the sections. While it does that, we'll cut back and talk about a few more features and so on. But it's the same thing I've done, but now being executed inside Tower. Yeah. So uh, the job status update flow, which you'll see shortly as it works its way through here, is really neat because Aside from everything else, it logs, logs each task being executed, what's being skipped. You see how long each step has taken? And all that goes into the log infrastructure, be it internal, Splunk, or some other third-party logging platform. But it also logs who ran it and when. And because also Tower's API-driven, you could have Jenkins, you could have other infrastructure. We've got plenty of customers plugging this into things like ServiceNow where for certain types of service requests, where the heavy lifting needs to be performed by Ansible, ServiceNow just makes an API request against Tower. Tower goes off and does all the heavy lifting. But if there's a problem, it's logged cleanly inside Tower. The operations team will get an alert if it goes wrong, and they can go in and see why there's an issue. Maybe there's something more major happened inside the environment. Uh, so you've got a view on your activity stream. You can actually schedule jobs to run at certain points in time say an environment check that's going to run every night at 2 a.m. Or maybe certain production deployments, you want to schedule them through Tower. The rolling deploy we talked to earlier, we want to schedule that to happen tomorrow at 2 a.m. It just happens, and if it fails, it will page me. Otherwise, I don't care. It's worked. Awesome. Um, the ability to do these multi-playbook workflows, the beauty of this is that each of these templates coming through here can be in this different source code repository. Their scripts, their IPs over there. Now, they should share, but, you know, their network people, they're special. And the database team are in here, and they've got their set of scripts. But at least they're sharing the capability to use them. At least you're getting some reuse out of what's going on inside the organization. <clears throat> the ability to scale out, you can build a very highly scale out environment of tower. You're gonna to be careful how you look at how it scales because ultimately it's a push model. You're not pushing every endpoint simultaneously, but you can set a certain degree of parallelism in terms of uh, how many endpoints it will try and interact with simultaneously. Uh, manage and track your inventory, smart inventories. It will even uh, do a degree of, um, in the same way things like Puppet collect facts about your environment, you can actually use it to collect data to feed into internal CMDB, because it collects an awful lot of metadata about your, your, uh, your infrastructure. Uh, scheduling jobs, uh, integrating notifications to a range of, of platforms, uh, and, and again, that idea of doing self-service IT. Playbooks with a single click, even develop dialogues around those playbooks, say that something you want to Why is this not running? I may have run out of RAM. This is all running locally on my laptop. Oh, no, it's running. It's actually down to the last one. So there's the first one run. And you can see pretty much everything's in green because we've already run it all. It's all good. It did change a couple of things here about the CentOS instance for some reason. Obviously, there's a bug in my playbook somewhere. And then it's jumped, and now it's gone through and it's completed all the tasks. So that app should still be deployed and working correctly. It hasn't changed anything to my detriment, and it's now run inside Tower. 
or you can get some quite complex chaining out of this. Uh, remote command execution. So aside from everything else, Ansible does allow for ad hoc remote commands. So if you want to run a one-off job against a large part of your infrastructure, maybe it is just a check to see whether a certain piece of software is installed, so it's configured in a particular way, then you can actually do a, a ad hoc command execution through the Ansible Tower interface or on the command line. External logging interaction. So that's where we've got to, and I've just shown you now that we can actually build all this as well with Tower alongside it. So all that's actually running locally on my laptop. Um, some recent things, isolated nodes, so these are the remote execution nodes to run inside DMZs or to allow better scale out or say you've got a multi data center um, environment. One thing with our subscription model for Tower, we don't charge you for Tower. We charge you for the endpoints Tower managers. So if you decide that you want a very highly scale out Tower environment or you want uh, different data centers to have their own dedicated Tower instances, and that's fine. We don't care how many tower instances you run. We just care how many endpoints you're managing from tower. An endpoint may be a Windows system, a Linux system, a network switch, a storage device, a cloud provider. And um, yes, I mentioned the insights integration, and there's a bunch of other enhancements recently in Tower 3.2. So saying automation is all about accelerating what we're doing and removing a large number of the, the simple errors that may occur. I was presenting about two years ago at the OpenStack Summit on building simple baby playpen OpenStack environments, and I realized what I was showing was a desk procedure. It's about two days before I got on the plane, or an Ansible playbook. So that when I actually gave the talk, I walked on stage and I started the playbook. I explained what I was trying to achieve. We got to the end of it work. We demoed the environment. I said, and here's the URL, the playbook. That demo is now so repeatable because, and it was faster than me copy and pasting to achieve the same outcome. But I taught the audience how to achieve the outcome, why we've gone through the steps. So who's accelerating? I mean, this is a subset and you're all customers and partners, so we can mention a few names, but there's some very big corporates out there using Ansible internally at scale getting an awful lot of value out of that click button approach. Now, this is the big thing now is networking. A large part of the approach to deploying networks really hasn't changed. You have the, the network teams who are love their CLI on their Cisco devices or their Juniper devices, or the ones that are stuck in some horrible user interface that's uh, somewhere out of the late 1990s, right? But this is a recent survey Gartner did of what organizations, people inside organizations are doing around network management. And the majority of it is CLI based, then it's GUI directly on the device, then it's the network vendor's own tooling, then they're looking at third party network automation tools, maybe someone looking towards APIs. We talked to one of my customers up in Auckland recently, and they'd invested in a phenomenal amount of Python to automate their network, to try and reach that infrastructure as code approach, because they didn't want to go down a vendor specific outcome. What they were doing was writing vendor specific Python. The Ansible approach to networking, today we support four, well, upstream the support for 44 networking platforms that ship as standard as part of Ansible if you go and install it today. There's a number of network vendors that are shipping additional network modules outside of our ecosystem. They only ship them to you if you are a customer. And it's an awful lot of network modules. So all the big network vendors are piled into this. If they're not up there, they should be. If you're in an environment where that name isn't up there, tell us. Odds on we're already having a conversation with them. Several of the larger vendors up there were bullied by their customers into adopting Ansible because it's so important to their big customers today. The big differentiator when we're talking about remote execution with networks is that we're in the case of uh, Linux and Windows hosts, we kind of push the code we're going to execute out to the endpoint. A little stub directory appears, the code drops into it, goes and runs on the the Linux system or the Windows system. That way we can make sure that configuration file is correct. 
that that software is really installed. In the case of a network device, we've got to use their native API, CLI, SSH, Telnet, heaven forbid, to go and interact with those devices. So it's a slightly different approach, but because we're agentless, we can talk to both. So similar to your diagram earlier, very much why automate your network, take a very much, you know, uh, take the developer DevOps smart and start applying it into that network ecosystem. And we've actually got a much deeper uh, conversation around that network ecosystem on providing guidance. One big part of this is how do you test your code before it hits the real network device? Now it's getting easier because a large number of those network devices are appearing as you know virtual appliances that you so you can actually go and prototype in your lab. We've got a lot of tooling around the edge to kind of pre-validate code, do code coverage analysis and, and other tricks before things start hitting real hardware because this really scares the network people. The fact that someone can make a minor configuration change and turn their entire network into 10 meg half duplex really isn't a good thing to do during business hours. But similar approach, this is uh, IOS, uh, enable interfaces, verify the status of um, um, network interfaces. So there's lots of examples in that network space. The same is true when we start talking to things like firewalls, low balances, all kinds of other infrastructure. What's really neat though is we're rolling these features up into Tower. So Tower's gonna to get a network visualizer. The idea here is that if we can give you an inventory of your network infrastructure, it can then build you a visual view of what your network looks like, an initial starting point for the definition of your network. You can then go and modify and apply what your network should really look like. So this is as we're evolving this, we're going to have you know, a UI drag and drop capability around uh, network topology and a, and a geographic view of what your network looks like, your data centers and so forth. So these are things that will be coming in the next few releases of Tower as we start. That whole network environment is, is really, really exciting right now. Windows, you mentioned earlier, over 70 modules today. It's a lot going on in that Windows space. Um, the beauty of this is no PowerShell. Uh, some of the initial examples are using Windows, say 18 months, two years ago. You'd actually embed quite a lot of PowerShell inside a playbook. Slowly the modules have improved to the point where things collapse down. The code becomes simpler. And again, it becomes that description of the outcome you want to achieve. So if you want to get started with Ansible, there's lots of really, really cool online resources. Uh, if you go and have a look at the Ansible GitHub, we have a thing called Lightbulb, which is a, a lab environment that you can go and run yourself internally. We've also got a new Ansible networking lab that I'm actually doing training on next week over in Australia. So that's something we'll be running an, uh, versions of here in New Zealand in the near future, I hope. Um, so, that's everything I've got. If you want the URLs, I'm not hard to find online, but all my code, all my Ansible playbooks are on GitHub. Uh, just while we're here, this is the OpenShift Ansible repository. So this is the playbooks and roles for deploying OpenShift at scale. So this is how we're using Ansible to deliver value as Red Hat. So once deploying any of our modern large scale infrastructure solutions, odds on they're being deployed using Ansible in a way that's repeatable, reproducible, upgradable, and scalable. Because Ansible's doing all the heavy lifting. Some amazing work gone into this. We'll tell you based on versions of OpenShift you want to deploy, including Origin, upstream OpenShift, and what version of Ansible you need and what version of the OpenShift Ansible runtime you need to deploy all of this. So there's lots and lots of examples in here. And I recently used it to deploy, instead of using OC cluster up, is to deploy a proper OpenShift enterprise environment for on a single VM for doing validation and testing of things on OpenShift. And so there's, I'm going to publish this up online at some point. 
So this deals with all of the various components I need, creates a default admin user, and everything. <laughs> we hit that exact same bug with the uh, ORED URL master node. Yeah, so I've put comments in yeah, here, if you can see all, yeah, some of the bugs comments. and workarounds as I've hit them. This is all in Git, so every time I've had a go, oh, I'm going to insert this bit, I'm going to say that thing, okay, I've hit this bug and this bug. I was building OpenShift through this because I was again doing it off a stub VM, so I already had the Linux install, I had to do with roll that back. I could build this a dozen times in the day, easy, and, and try things out and tweak it and tweak it and tweak it as a way to have an alternative to do no SQL store. I love Ansible, it makes my life a lot easier. Ultimately though, it's consuming this behemoth of an amazing repository of Ansible to do the outcome. It's really cool. So, thank you. Thank you. Questions? More cold beverages? Or the tea? Or the drinks? There's wine. There's red wine left. The wine is in soda. The water.